Welcome, everybody. Uh, really, it's uh, such an honor uh, to have all of you with us today as we are kicking off a brand new uh, teaching series this morning called Build This House. Let me hear you just say that out loud. Say, Build This House. Build this house. Come on, one more time. Say, Build This House. Build this house. Yeah, so that's what we're going to be talking about for the next little bit. Uh, but just before we get into that, I just actually wanted to say something really quick uh, on the heels of that announcement from Pastor Brian. Uh, so yeah, our, our new campus, uh, they're actually in action this morning. Like as we're here in this room, there's something called Open Streets Windsor uh, going on where they close down Wyandotte and all the vendors go out on the street. So we've, we, we've got a whole team down there, the launch team plus several others that are just ministering uh, right there on Wyandotte and Parent. Uh, and then next Sunday is going to be our very first service down there. And uh, God willing, years to come after that. And so, yeah, we are really excited. Now, one special thing I want to say about that, because it, it's going to help. The building that we purchased was an old bank. that we did. There were some renovations. We did more to the building. It's only so big. Okay, so we have a launch team that's been trained and prepared and ready to do ministry in the downtown. Now, there's something that could actually happen here that would be really bad. And that would be if several of you decided, hey, I want to go worship down there. What's going to happen, uh, quite literally, is we're, we're not going to have room to actually reach the neighborhood down there. You understand? So we did not invest this money and this time and this training and this whole vision so that people from here could simply worship down there. That's not the mission, the vision, or any of it. The, the, the point is that we can actually reach the neighborhood, so we need room to be able to do that. So if, if you're looking for a way to support the downtown church plant, that's awesome. You can give financially. Uh, we need your prayers uh, that, those are great ways, but we also need you here. <laughs> Does that make sense? So that we can do ministry down there. Got it? Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Um, all right, let's get into our new teaching series, Build This House. How many of you like building stuff? Throw up those hands. You're just like, give me a hammer, give me some nails, I'm going to build. Yeah? How many of you like tearing things down? Yeah. You're like, give me a sledgehammer and a wall. I've got some anger I need to deal with. That's okay. That's okay. We'll pray for you. Um, my dad, uh, for those who knew him, he was somehow both a builder and a tear downer. Uh, he had what I like to call restless builder syndrome. Like, uh, he passed away 16 years ago now, which is wild that it was that long, but uh, if you knew my dad, he, he was just always going, always building, all the time. Um, in fact, we had this um, ping pong table growing up in our garage, and my brother Marty and I loved it. We'd just go to the garage and play ping pong. And one day I came home from school, went into the garage to get the, the ping pong table, and in there, and it's gone. So I was like, where'd the, where'd the ping pong table go? I'm asking around. But I found out my dad got bored. And so he chopped it up into little pieces for some project he was working on. Now, you might ask, what on earth can you use a chopped up ping pong table for? I still don't know, uh, honestly. I don't know, but this was my dad, right? Like, like, he just couldn't sit still. Like, he had to be working, building something. And some of us, you're just wired that way. Go, 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 right? And there's, honestly, there, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, God built us like that, right, uh, for his glory. And uh, this series, however, that we're in, we're not going to be talking about building physical homes. Uh, we're not, because honestly, I just don't have much to say on that. <laughs> um, but rather, for the next little bit, what we're going to be doing, it, when we talk about, like, build this house, um, we're talking about uh, the church, uh, the church of God. You know, uh, for those who don't know my story, um, this is my church home. I was born in, and raised in this church. I was actually born and raised uh, when we were downtown, University Gospel Temple. Like, I, I remember uh, as uh, being a small boy and my dad holding my hand as we walked across planks of wood to stay out of the mud 
indoors because the roof wasn't uh, on and the floor wasn't laid. And I, and, I, and I remember walking through this place even as a young boy. I've spent a lot of time in this building. I, I actually tried. It's funny, Pastor Gary, you're talking about me with my numbers. I, I tried this past week to, to calculate how much time I've spent in this building. You see, there used to be a grade school here that, that I went to for like JK to grade eight. And then there was like your kids' ministries and your youth ministries. I was a paid intern here at the church for almost four years. And then I've been pastoring full time for 15 years here at this church. And, and by my very, very rough conservative estimate, I've spent somewhere in the ballpark of 62,700 hours in this building. And even as I say that, I honestly don't know if that's a brag or if this is a moment of confession. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't figured it out, but my, my point is, is that I, I know this building in and out. Every single part of it. I, I know this building very well. I'm very grateful for this building. I thank God for this building. But let's be biblical about it this morning. This building is not the house of God. Amen. We are. Do you hear me? This building facilitates the house of God, but it is not the house of God. We are. In fact, this is just my, 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 my first point. If you're taking notes, write this down. We are the house of God. I'm talking about like we the people, okay? We are the house of God. The house of God today is not made up of brick and mortar, but flesh and bone. And I just want to show this to you in a couple different passages. You got a Bible. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 3. Here's what's interesting about the book of Hebrews. Um, uh, Hebrews, we, we, there's a lot of debate over who the author of the book is. Uh, we don't really know for sure who wrote it. But we do know the audience. The audience of the book of Hebrews was a first century Jewish church. Uh, they... they um, th th these would have been men and women that were raised in, in Judaism, and then they, they came to see Jesus as their Messiah and their Lord and Savior, and now they're trying to do this Christian walk thing, this Christian church thing, and the author writes this, verse 4 to 6 of chapter 3. It says, For every house has a builder, but the one who built everything is God. Moses was certainly faithful in God's house as a servant, his work was an illustration of the truths God would later reveal. But Christ, as the Son, is in charge of God's entire house. Now watch this. And we are God's house if we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ. I love this. The author says, listen, long ago there was a time when God's house was physical, tangible, He's talking about Moses in the tabernacle during the Exodus event. Remember, let my people go, cross the Red Sea, they end up. God gives them the instructions of uh, what was called the tent of meeting, the, the tabernacle, physical location. You enter the Holy of Holies, you have the Ark of the Covenant, God's presence, God's house. And here it says, yeah, there was a time when that was true, but that's not today. Now... We live in a world where, where we are God's house. I, I, I love what it says. It says all of that was just an illustration of something that would later be revealed. Okay, well, begs the question, what was later revealed? Jesus. And because of his work on the cross, a death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and the coming of the Holy Spirit, we are now God's house. He lives and moves and breathes in us. Do you see the picture? I'll show it to you another way. Uh, go with me over to 1 Peter chapter 2. Love this. Uh, Peter writes this letter to the church in uh, Asia Minor, which is like modern-day Turkey. Uh, and he writes this, uh, 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5. It says, as you come to him, so you, the church, as you come to him, Jesus, the living stone, 
rejected by humans and chosen by God and precious to him. I love verse 5. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So I wanted to somewhat illustrate this, this point because I want you to get the picture in your head. What, what Peter's saying to the church is that every Christian, every Christian is like a constructive material. And, 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 and by design, we are designed to be in a construct with other believers, right? That, that we, we somehow fit together. And, and, and I love the picture. It says, but, but the stones that the church of Jesus Christ are built on, they're, they're, they're not physical stones. He says they're living stones. The, the picture is that every single one of us, like, like God is building his church, uh, not necessarily cinder block by cinder block, but person by person. We are the house of God. We are the house, you know, um, it was just over three years ago that we uh, launched Church Online for our church. And uh, really what kind of threw us into that was, was COVID, uh, as many churches had to try to figure that out, um, you know, back in 2020. But, but the, what you should know is actually before COVID even hit, we were actively involved in this conversation. We were buying cameras. We were doing tests. We were, we were looking into creating an online platform. And the reason why is because there's so many great benefits to it. If you're sick, <laughs> church online's great. Like, honestly, it is great if you're sick. You can be at home. You can still track with us. Church online is great for when you're traveling. You can be in Florida and watching us here this morning. Church online is is great if you're new to the city and you're just kind of looking around for a church that, that you might fit well in. Church online can be an amazing evangelistic tool. We have had people who have come to a saving knowledge in Jesus simply because we air what's happening in this room. There's many benefits to church online, but can I just tell you really quick, church online is not great as a new default for your life. It's not. And the reason why is because we are living stones. We are designed to be, we are like constructive material that is designed to be in a construct with other believers. And the picture here is that when we come together and when we worship Jesus together and when we exalt the name of Jesus together, when we serve together, like, I love this, it's like we become God's House. Isn't that just amazing? Like, honestly, this is amazing. Like, we are God's house. That's the first point. Now, here's the second point that I want us to wrestle with, and this just brings joy to my heart. God is building his house. <laughs> oh, come on. God is building his house. He is. I, I've, I've already told you that my dad was, I'm going to talk about my dad today. Um, you know, I, he was go, 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 go type of guy, right? Which, which means I've, I have all these memories of uh, working with my dad over the years. I, I remember this one summer, we, we just shingled a bunch of homes, like roofs. We got up on roofs and shingled them. And uh, the very first time that we were shingling a house, interestingly, my dad didn't like throw me up on the roof and say, hey, good luck. Hope you don't fall off. No, like, that's ridiculous. No, he, he brought me up there. He showed me where to place my feet. He, he laid out the shingles, showed me the plan, where to put the nail, how to hammer down. Like, he walked me through every step. Why? Because he loves me. And he doesn't want to see me die. Right? Like, like th but this is actually kind of like a good picture of how God operates with us. Is, is, is God's building the house. Like, he's the chief architect, right? He's, he's the one with the plan, but then what he does is he brings us into the picture and says, hey, why don't you come up on the roof with me? <laughs> Here's a hammer. Why, 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 don't, why don't you swing here? Why don't you speak here? Why don't you show love here? And he does this because he is a good, loving God. Like, honestly, isn't it amazing? Just amazing that God invites us into the process of building his house, the church. 
It's absolutely amazing. But Parkwood, please never make the mistake. We are not the chief architect. God is. God is. He's got the blueprints. He's, he's got the plan for how this is going to go. I love Psalm 127. It just says it this way. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. So here we are, 100 years old. I mean, wasn't last weekend just amazing? <laughs> like, it was just amazing. 100 years old. And, um, you know, that big celebration's behind us, and now we're kind of charting this course, you know, moving, moving forward. And, and I just have to tell you, like, unless God is in this, unless God is the one directing this, unless God is the one calling the shots here, we labor, yes, but if we're not careful, we labor in vain. Amen. It says, all of our efforts, our time, our energy, our work, useless, Unless God's the one putting the hammer in our hands and saying, swing here, go here, serve here, love here. Like, like God, this is just what I want to show you, is the chief architect. He's the one who's ultimately building his house. And I, I want to show this to you in another passage of Scripture. If you flip over to Matthew 16, Jesus brings his disciples to a region called Caesarea Philippi. And, and here he asks them a very important question. He just said, who, who do you say that I am? Peter. It's always Peter, <laughs> you know? Uh, Peter jumps up and he says, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. Look, look at how Jesus responded. Matthew 16, pick it up in verse 17. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, now this is, you have to understand, the rock that Jesus is talking about is not Peter. There's two different words here. It's wordplay. Peter is Petros here. Um, you know, it, it, it's different. It's getting at like the bedrock, Petra. Right? It's saying something, there, there's something else going on here. The rock that Jesus is talking about is the confession that Peter just made. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus says, yes, God's the one who, who the father, he's the one who showed that to you. And here's what you need to know. On this rock, on this confession, I love this. Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I love it. Jesus says, hey, I will build my church. He doesn't say, hey, have fun building your church. <laughs> he says, no, it's mine. <laughs> it's, Jesus says, it's my church. I will build my church, and the gates of hell won't, won't, won't prevail against it. Now, th this passage, I grew up hearing, and I got to be honest, I didn't really think about it. It just kind of sounded fun. You know, everyone was clapping whenever it was preached. And I was like, oh, yeah. But I, I, I didn't think. And I, I, I think what I thought this meant for a long time was that, like, we were behind these gates. And the devil was on the offense. And because we're behind these gates in a place of safety, that God is going to build the church from a place of, of, of safety. Okay, let, let me tell you. That's not what this is saying. What, what this is saying, right, is that, is that there are people right now who do not know Jesus. The image is that they are behind the gates of hell. They are, they are, they are in a place of death. And it's our job to go get them. And Jesus says, when, when my church actually listens to my voice and goes where I tell them to go and speaks where I tell them to speak and love where I tell them to love, Jesus says, yeah, I'll build there. Jesus says, when, when, when I find a church that's brought together not because of the uh, color of their skin, their gender, their socioeconomic standing, but rather because of me, Jesus says, yeah, I'll build there. When he says, when I find a church community that's willing to risk it all to lift up my name, I will build my church, and hell better watch out for a church with mission. Yeah. That's what Jesus says. It's the church on the offense, not the devil. 
It's the church with a mission here. Jesus says, yeah, I will build my church. It's amazing, right? We are the house of God. Living stones. Breathing, living stones. And then I love the picture. Not only are we the house of God, but God is building his house brick by brick, person by person. But it begs the question, okay, so what does this all mean? Like, like what, do we, what do we do with this? And I, I, I kind of wrestled over how to communicate this. There's probably a better way I could say it, but I'm just going to say it. He, he, here's what we do with a message like this. Point number three, you need to pick up a hammer and swing. You, you, you need to get involved. You, you need to be a part of the solution, not just sitting on the sidelines pointing out the problems. You need, you need to pick up a hammer and swing. You need to contribute of your time, your talent, your treasure. You, 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 you need to be a part of God's great building project, the church. Um, this is my dad. Let's go back to that. It's true that he was go, 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 just like working all the time, building all the time. But the reality is most times I didn't want to work with him, especially when I was like a teenage boy. Um, I, just like most teenage boys, I would rather be playing baseball with my friends than on a roof uh, getting heat strokes, swinging a hammer, right? Like, um, and so often, like, ah, I was just talking to my mom about this, like it was often, you know, it's like, Dan, Mark, I need you. Come, you know, and we try to come up with our excuses, you know. But you know what's interesting? All during that time, uh, I still wanted the benefits of being my father's son. I wanted a roof over my head. I wanted food on the table, right? I just didn't want to pick up a hammer and swing. I didn't actually want to be a part of what led to all those great benefits. I just wanted to receive it. And, and the reason why I share this is I actually think that's a good picture for maybe how some, even here today, this is how you view the church. It's, you, 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 you want the benefits of all of this, but you don't want to actually get your hands dirty. Um, and, and can I just tell you, like, there are benefits to this. Like, like, there's nothing wrong with wanting a good meal when you come to church. Like, like as we preach and we worship, like we want you to be fed spiritually. There's nothing wrong with that. But that alone is not the plan of Jesus for the church. It's not. It's, it's not even closer. Like, like that alone, just, just coming and taking and consuming, like this is not the way of Jesus at all. In, in, in the days of Jesus... The worst job of, of all had to be the person who washed the feet of the other people. Normally, it was so bad. Uh, 2,000 years ago, it was actually reserved for the slaves of the day. You see, the, the, the roads, uh, for the most part, were, were dirt roads in between the towns and everything. And uh, they would be filled with animal feces and urine and all other sorts of nastiness. And after miles and miles of walking on those roads, like your feet smelled like Satan's breath. Okay, like, you with me? Like, just bad. And at the end of the day, it's like, hey, well, who's, who's, who's taking that off, right? And so this was a job um, for the slaves of the day. And uh, in John chapter 13, Jesus finds himself at the Last Supper, and he looks around the room. He sees proud hearts, and he sees dirty feet. So he gets a bucket, fills it with water, puts on a slave's apron, and he starts to wash his disciples' feet, one by one. And he gets over to Peter. He gets to Peter, and he looks at him, and he says, give me your feet, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Peter says, no. He looks at Jesus and says, no. He says, you don't wash my feet. He says, I know who you are. He says, you're Jesus. You're, you're the son of God. You're the Messiah, Lord, God, Savior. You don't wash my feet. 
Peter here actually had a very common first century Jewish mindset. The strong survive. The greater ones are served. They do not serve others. And Jesus flips that around and says, no, Pete, here's what you don't understand. In my kingdom, the greater one isn't served, but humbly serves others. He says, give me your feet, Pete. <laughs> and he washes the feces and the urine and everything off of them. And he goes through one by one by one. He gets all the way down to the end. And then John 13, 14, and 15, Jesus said this. He says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Now, it's interesting. Some faith traditions think that Jesus was instituting literal foot washing here. And still, they get together on Sunday mornings with basins of water and they wash each other's feet. Uh, I don't think that's what was happening. Uh, I, I, I don't think Jesus was instituting literal foot washing, but rather a mindset of foot washing. I think what Jesus was doing was he was instituting a mindset of not just taking, but actively contributing. A mindset of not just saying, I want the benefits, but actually I'm going to be a part of the building project. He says, give me your feet. And now just like I have done for you, now I want you to do for one another. Parkwood, you need to pick up a hammer and swing. Like, it's okay. Like, there's moments you might be coming from another church, a rough situation, something like that. There is a season where it's okay to sit and receive. But I am telling you, to live in that mode is detrimental to your spiritual health. In this, none of this will ever feel like family to you if all you ever treat this as is like some lecture that we give and you come in and run it. That's not the point. The point is that we would come together trusting that God is the one building this house, listening to his command, picking up that hammer, swinging, being a part of the greatest building project on earth, the church of Jesus Christ. We need you to pick up a hammer and swing, and we need you to pick up a hammer and swing now. I'll tell you why. Um, we're growing a lot as a church, uh, and it's amazing. Oh, probably over the last couple of years, especially kind of coming out of all the COVID craziness and everything. Um, uh, right now, where we find ourselves, this is probably the largest our church has ever been in our 100 years, and. And, and, and there's so many great benefits to that, like so many. But there's also some unique tensions that come with this. Uh, mainly, we're, we're running out of room. I'll just tell you, plain, we're running out of room in this house. Like, yeah, there's a few seats over here in the, in the pod, but it's, it's, it's pretty full, right? We just don't have a lot of room to grow. Uh, and it's not just this room, uh, we're running out of room in our parking lots. Uh, about six months ago, we had to make a plea in so many of you, you don't even park in our lots, you're parking across the streets just to free up room so that visitors won't have to drive around for 20 minutes just to find a spot. Like, thank you, but that's a problem. We're, we're running out of space here, we're running out of space in our parking lots, and maybe worst of all, we're running out of space in our kids' ministry. Uh, like, it is almost a weekly occurrence right now when we're having to tell parents, oh, sorry, we don't have room for your kids. Like, we are in like a baby booming phase, and I love it. But that's a problem. That's a problem now. And I just got to tell you, like, I love worshiping with all of us in this room together. I love the full feel, but the reality is, if nothing changes, we will stop growing as a church. In fact, I'd say it this way. If nothing changes, we will continue to do ministry in a way where we can't even minister to our kids effectively. We've got a problem that comes with size and growth. And so we've been talking about this uh, as a staff probably like the last two months and just kind of knowing the fall was coming and, and all that stuff and I just wanted to let you know that I've made the decision that starting October 1st, that's two Sundays from now, 
we are gonna be moving into a multi-service model again. We're gonna have one service at 9 a.m. and we're gonna have another one at 11 a.m. And yes, it's gonna be a little bit of a different feel. It's not gonna be as full and all that kind of stuff. But, but here's what we ensure if we do this. Number one, that we have room for, for growth <laughs> in the days ahead. How many know God's not done with us yet? He's not done with us yet. Yeah, we're going to ensure that people have parking spaces and people won't have to park across the street and walk a long way in, or at least for the next little bit. Like, you know, we're, 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 we're going to ensure that every family that comes, we actually have a spot for their kid. But we, we need to make some changes here to get there. And so that's two weeks away. So two weeks away, we're going back. And we did this for a few years in COVID. We're just going back to that uh, 9 a.m., 11 a.m. But because of this, hear me, we need you to pick up a hammer and swing. We, we, we need right now, we need people to, uh, oh man, we need youth workers. We need ushers, greeters, security. We, we need, uh, there's so many different things. Pro- probably the main thing right now that we need is we need people to hold babies in Jesus' name, okay? Like, like behind this wall, there's a lot of kids. You're like, we know, we dropped them off, you know? There's a lot of kids back there and we, we need help. We, we've got most of it manned going into this multi-service thing, but we still need more help, especially for our young, young children. Like I said, we're in a baby booming phase. A lot of you just keep on having kids and we wanna love them and we wanna hold them and we wanna make room for them, but we need you to do that. And the beauty of actually the multi-service model is that you can serve one and attend one. You can, you can just give. You can pick up a hammer and you can swing. So listen, uh, tech team, if you could just throw this up. If you text the word serve and just leave this up for a couple minutes. Pull out your phone, everybody. Right here, text the word serve to this number, 833-202-2384. If you text the word serve to that number, here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna, within a couple minutes, you're gonna be sent an automatic text back to your phone with a link. You click on that link, it's gonna bring you uh, to our webpage and there's gonna be all these different areas where you can serve, click on it. There's kind of a different system for different programs, but that'll bring you to the page that you need to be on. If you don't have a phone with you and you still wanna pick up a hammer and swing here, great. Pick up a card in the seat in front of you. Write on there what you wanna do. Drop it off at the info desk or put it in the giving station. But here's the bottom line. Church, we are God's house. We are living stones. God is building his church. He is the chief architect. He's the one bringing us in like a good loving father and saying, just, just trust me. Swing here and go here and serve here and love. Like, like this is it, but it's gonna take all of us together to do this. It's gonna get all all of us, so please join us in this. I don't know any other way of saying it, but listen, bottom line here, stand on up. Bottom line is this, that the church is God's plan A. There is no plan B. There is no plan B. Like right from the beginning, like when Jesus came the first time, he establishes his church. Jesus dies for his church, rose for his church, and one day Jesus is coming back for his church. So what better way, honestly, to live your life than to give it to the one thing that Jesus gave so much for? His church, his house. So Parkwood, let's join God in building his house, amen? Amen. So listen, uh, before we go, we're going to sing this song again, Build Your Church, like he is building his house. And before we go, I just want us to lift up our voice in this room. I want us to sing. I want us to shout. I want us to proclaim that Jesus will build his church and the gates of hell cannot stop a church on mission.